My name is Alan Grossenheider and I serve as the Deputy University Librarian. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today um, for this program entitled Henry Thoreau and His Letters, A New Perspective. For over 20 years, the UCSB Library has housed and supported the writings of Henry D. Thoreau, the definitive scholarly edition of Thoreau's works directed by Elizabeth Witherall and published by Princeton University Press. 17 of a projected 28 volumes are now in print. Eight volumes of the journal, eight volumes of writings, and today we celebrate the publication of the first volume of Correspondence. When complete, the three-volume set of Correspondence will include every extent letter written or received by Thoreau. These letters provide the only direct evidence we have of Thoreau's relationships and interactions with others. They offer a glimpse into the, his changing presentation of himself as he gossips with family members, exchanges philosophical views with friends, and responds to his fans. Beth Witherall joined the staff of the Thoreau edition at Princeton U University in 1974 and became editor-in-chief in 1980. Three years later, she moved the Thoreau edition here, where it has been ever since, uh, minus a six-year break when she ran the project at Northern Illinois University. Beth has taught at UCSB, Northern Illinois, Bernard College, and Princeton University. She served on the board of the Thoreau Society from 1990 to 2001 and served as president from 1996 to 2000. In 2008, she received the Thoreau Society Medal in recognition of significant and sustained contributions that exemplify the ideals and values represented by Henry David Thoreau. Following today's talk by Beth about the new volume of correspondence, two readers will dramatize portions of an exchange of letters between Thoreau and his mentor and neighbor, Emerson. Sophie Hassett will read for Emerson and is a graduate of UCSB's theater program and is currently an intern in the Women, Gender, and Sexual Equity Department. Casey Caldwell, alumnus of Westmont's theater program, who is the interlibrary loan student supervisor here in the library, will read for Thoreau. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. So thank you again for coming, and please join me in welcoming Beth Witherall. Thanks, Alan. I've worked at the Thoreau edition since 1974 as Alan said, and since 1980 I've been the head of the project. As editor-in-chief, I'm the one who is ultimately responsible for the accuracy of the text and the documentation in our books. Those are our books sitting up there, the ones that we've published so far. In the capacity, in my capacity as editor-in-chief, I've reviewed the work of staff members and editors on 12 volumes. One of Thoreau's books, two collections of his essays, this is within this set that's there, one collection of his translations from Greek and Latin, and eight volumes of his journal. For the last five years, I've been focusing almost exclusively on the 650 or so letters that make up Thor's correspondence. Um, this includes about 340 letters that he wrote and about 325 letters that he received. Now in these days of texting and tweeting, 650 letters may seem like a lot, but it's a really small number by comparison with, say, Emerson. Just the letters Emerson wrote, that is, without the ones he received, filled 10 volumes that average 500 pages each. And that doesn't count another volume of Emerson's and Carlyle's letters back and forth. That's another 600 pages. So big difference there. But Emerson was a public intellectual. He was arguably the most widely known American intellectual of his time. And Thoreau, who is now as celebrated as Emerson, lived a very different life. One of the great pleasures of working on Thoreau's letters has been the perspective they provide on what his life was like and what he was like. I call this a new perspective because in the letters, unlike in his essays and books and in his journal, Thoreau is interacting directly with other individuals. In his essays and books, he has an audience in mind, of course, but it's a general audience with a collective set of characteristics. On some issues, he's trying to shock or to persuade that audience. On others, he knows he's preaching to the choir. In his journal, he's talking to himself. He's drafting accounts of trips, reactions to events. He's trying out narrative devices. He's telling stories about his neighbors. He also uses his journal to record information about his reading. 
and about the recurring natural phenomena of Concord, and he's using his journal to create resources for his own further study and writing. But in his letters, he's communicating with and responding to specific individuals. It's the difference between what I'm saying now to all of you as a group and a series of conversations I would have with Alan or Casey or Sophie. He tunes his presentations to the people and the situations. He uses different voices in different relationships. So we as readers learn more about him and about how he lived in the world from his letters than we do from any other form of his writing. You'll hear one of these voices in the exchange with Emerson, and I'll give you a few more examples. What I can show you also that you don't have access to in the printed volume of correspondence is the development of his handwriting. It's not deeply significant, but it's kind of fun to see. This is, this is one of the very earliest uh, forms of hand that he used, and it's actually, I'm sorry to say, more readable than the later hand. <laughs> this is the first surviving letter. It's a business letter, and it has the tone of a business letter. This is the 17-year-old Thoreau writing to Oliver Sparhawk, the steward of Harvard College, essentially the facilities manager at Harvard, to request repairs to the dorm room he shares with James Richardson. Sir, the occupants of Hollis 32 would like to have that room painted and whitewashed. Also, if possible, to have a new hearth put in. Yours respectfully, Thoreau and Richardson. <laughs> and this was hand delivered, no postage necessary, because he was at Harvard and Sparhawk was at Harvard. In his letters to his family, his brother John, his sisters Helen and Sophia, his mother and father, Thoreau's language is informal, and he can be really playful and affectionate. It's fun to see. Um, on March 17, 1838, he writes to John to suggest that they go job hunting together. Thoreau's graduated just recently, and he doesn't have a job. And you want to go down to where the arrow is. I have a proposal to make. I'm just reading parts of these. Suppose by the time you are released, John did have a job, we should start in company for the West and there either establish a school jointly or procure ourselves separate situations. Suppose, moreover, you should get ready to start previous to leaving Taunton, where John is teaching, to save time. Go I must at all events. He needs a job. Dr. Jarvis enumerated nearly a dozen schools which I could have, all such as would suit you equally well. I wish you would write soon about this. It is high season to start. The canals are now open and traveling comparatively cheap. I think I can borrow the cash in this town. There's nothing like trying. On July 7th, 1843, he writes to his mother, Cynthia Thoreau, from Staten Island. Oh, I should say the circles, those are not on the manuscript. This is a, this is a PDF of a copy of the manuscript. The circles are things We've been working on these letters since I started at the Thoreau edition, and the circles are things somebody somewhere along the line couldn't understand and made it, called attention to. Anyway, um, he writes to his mother from Staten Island where he is tutoring Waldo Emerson's nephew. Um, and he got very homesick. Dear mother, I was very glad, this is at the very top, I was very glad to get your letters and paper, letter and papers. Tell father that circumstantial letters make very substantial reading at any rate. I like to know even how the sun shines and garden grows with you. And when you get to the end of this one, and he's written, this is, I'll show you some folded versions of these, of these letters. I made some so I could see how they were actually mailed. Very, at the very bottom, he writes, your affectionate, YR, your affectionate son, HDT, doesn't have room for his whole name, but he puts his, he puts his initials in. She'll know who it is. On October 24th, 1847, he writes to his sister, Sophia, who's visiting cousins in Maine for the winter. And this is on the page on the left. Give my respects to the whole Penobscot tribe. This is the Penobscots occupied Maine, of course, before. Um, were the, the, the Native American tribe in Maine, and tell them that I trust we are good brothers still and endeavor to keep the chain of friendship bright, though I do dig up a hatchet now and then. Well, the hatchets are, he, he had a, he found Indian artifacts everywhere. He could pick them up off the ground. There's a big collection of arrowheads and artifacts uh, at Harvard that he collected. I trust you will not stir from your comfortable winter's quarters, Miss Bruin, or even put your head out of your hollow tree till the sun has melted the snow in the spring and the green buds they are a swelling from your brother, Henry. So you see the handwriting get a little messier. 
<laughs> I mean, it's pretty neat back here, but it gets messier and messier. Um, we'll, we'll go back a bit um, here to 1847, a little bit back in June. In the late 1840s, Thoreau collected specimens for Louis Agassiz, the great naturalist and geologist who taught at Harvard. Um, this is the June 1, 1847 letter to James Elliott Cabot, who was Agassiz's assistant at that time, and we hear a different voice here. This is not a formal voice, but it's precise and detailed nevertheless. He writes, Dear Sir, I send you 15 pouts, 17 perch, 13 shiners, one larger land tortoise, and five muddy tortoises, all from the pond by my house. That's Walden. Also, seven perch, five shiners, eight brims, four dace, two muddy tortoises, five painted ditto tortoises, and three land ditto, all from the river, one black snake alive, and one deer mouse, <laughs> probably not alive anymore if it's in there with the black snake, <laughs> caught last night in my cellar. The tortoises were all put in alive. The fishes were alive yesterday, i.e. Monday, and some this morning. Observe the difference between those from the pond, which is pure water, and those from the river. I will send the light-colored trout and the pickerel with the longer snout, which is our large one, when I meet with them. I have set a price upon the heads of snapping turtles, though it is late in the season to get them. If I wrote red finned eel, this is in his earlier message to Cabot, it was a slip of the pen. I meant red finned minnow. This is their name here, though smaller specimens have but a slight reddish tinge at the base of the pectorals. Will you at your leisure answer these questions? Do you mean to say that the 12 banded minnows which I sent are undescribed or only one? What are the scientific names of those minnows, which have any? Are the four dace I send today identical with one of the former, and what are they called? Is there such a fish as the black sucker described, distinct from the common? Yours in great haste, Henry D. Thoreau. <laughs> in my final example of a voice, this is a response to James Monroe, a potential publisher of his first book, A Week on the Concord in Merrimack, and Monroe did actually publish it but this is before that was settled. Thoreau was both formal and firm. Monroe had offered to publish the book at Thoreau's expense, an offer Thoreau declines, but not until you get to the postscript. <laughs> and he's got it, it's as though it's not even worthy to be mentioned in the body of the letter. The, the, the offer to pay himself is what he ended up choosing. It's what he ended up choosing to do, but at this point he was hoping he wouldn't have to. Dear sir, Mr. Emerson has showed me your note to him. Emerson and Monroe had, had com corresponded about this, and says that he thinks you must have misunderstood him. If you will inform me how large an addition you contemplated, and what will be the whole or outside of the expense, the book is about the size of one volume of Emerson's essays, I will consider whether I will pay one half the same, or whatever of my part one half the profits has failed to pay, at the end of six months after the day of publication, if that is agreeable to you this arrangement to affect only one edition. The manuscript is quite ready and is now in New York. Please answer this as soon as convenient. Yours, etc. Henry D. Thoreau. P.S. <laughs> he turns over the page. I should have said above that I decline your proposition as it now stands. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get another of Thoreau's voices in the performance that's coming up, but first I want to mention a couple of other ways to look at the letters and to suggest what those perspectives yield. Both involve looking at the letters as material objects, first individually and then as a group. As material objects, letters are fascinating. Each one carries so much of the kind of information that I suppose would be called extra textual. It's outside the text itself. It's information that tells you a lot about the writer's circumstances, how his or her behavior was shaped by the economic and cultural conditions of the time. For example, before 1845, postage was charged on the basis of the number of sheets of paper being sent and the distance the letter was to travel. So uh, the cost of a substantial letter could approach a dollar, which was a day's wages for a laborer. And he knows this <laughs> from philately, I guess. Um, to reduce the number of sheets and thus the cost, correspondents sometimes resorted to cross-writing. <laughs> This involved turning a completed page 90 degrees, writing across the existing contents of the letter. This is a relatively easy cross-written letter to read. Some, especially people with very tiny handwriting, pr produce letters that are just very difficult to, to decipher. This um, is a letter that Thoreau wrote 
October 8, 1841 to Isaiah Williams, he did this cross writing to keep it under the limit. This is what folded up and ready to send the letter would look like. Um, it, it's clumsy because I had to make it out of four sheets of paper, but it's actually one sheet of paper originally. Here's page one, two, three, four, and then he goes back and he does some more cross writing on one. Folds it up in the manner of the time, although some were folded in triangles. I, Thor, I, didn't, I haven't found any of Thor's folded in triangles. Um, tucked, tucks one piece into another, sticks a little bit of sealing wax in there to hold everything together. Very interesting. I, I couldn't, when I first started working on Thor's letters and I would see these spots of sealing wax and I would see letters torn away when the, you know, when the letter was opened. If the person writing the letter didn't position the sealing wax carefully, it tore part of the letter away. Some people were very neat about that, some were not. Um, finally, I thought, I've got to figure out how these things were folded. <laughs> so I've got a bunch of folded ones. It's kind of fun. <laughs> and what I've found is that if I can get an image of the piece of paper stuck to the wax, and there's a letter on that piece of paper stuck to the wax, a character from the letter, and then I reverse that image, I can see the character. So I've been able to pick up a little short words at the ends of lines that got ripped away that are on the other side. It's, it's anyway. <laughs> um, so to eliminate postage altogether, travelers carried letters for one another, for their friends and acquaintances. And sometimes I read, taverns had boards that travelers coming through would post letters that they had picked up in their hometown and that were going on the stage line, but they weren't going on. So they would tack them up onto these boards and somebody else going to, you know, I don't know, a rustuk would pick it up and take it onto a rustuk. In, uh, we know of a couple, there, there's evidence of a couple situations in which Thoreau uh, and his friends did this, not tack them on boards, but, you know, carried things for one another. And the way you find that out is you look on the address page. Um, this is a letter from Charles Lane to Thoreau, um, February 17, 1846, and you see um, his address, and then it's favored by ABA, which means uh, Amos Bronson Alcott carried it for Lane to Thoreau and, and dropped it off. Um, until 1855, it was possible to send a letter without prepaying. This is something that I found out working on correspondence that I found fascinating. You didn't, you could, you could require your, the recipient to pay. Just by not, you could drop it to the post office, it went, and if the recipient didn't want it, the recipient didn't pay. Not a losing proposition for the, for the post office, but. This circumstance made writers more conscious of the value of what they had to communicate, and it made them more attentive to the etiquette involved in the decision to prepay or not. A comment in a July 21, 1843 letter that Thoreau sent his sister Helen from Staten Island suggests that he did not always prepay. He wrote, I am not in such haste to write home when I remember that I make my readers pay the postage. I contact, well, I was doing research for the general introduction to correspondence when I contacted Lean, Neil Coker, who is a, 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 works at the American Philatelic Research Library, and he told me that if the word paid, and we'll get to this, you see that it's stamped and written. If the word paid appears on the address leaf, the sender paid. If not, the recipient had to pay when picking up the letter from the post office. This is, you know, in some big cities, mail was delivered, but in most of the country, you went to the post office to get your mail, which made it a, a, an, unusual, an unusually social occasion that had all of its own components. Anyway, address leaves don't always survive, but when they do, they can offer suggestive information about the dynamics of the relationship between the sender and the recipient. This is a letter that Thoreau wrote uh, May 28, 1838. We're going back to the early time when Thoreau doesn't have a job and he's looking for one to his Harvard classmate, Henry Vose. He writes, if I remember aright, you are to commence your studies in this fall and will accordingly then vacate the situation you at present occupy. If this be the case, and the gentleman you are with wishes to employ a private tutor another year, will you be so kind as to mention my name to him, and as soon as may be, inform me of his intentions. 
since Thoreau was the petitioner here, it may not have been a coincidence that he paid the postage. <laughs> Finally, I want to look at the letters as a group. The important thing to know is that the narrative they present is discontinuous. Um, so many of them are missing. The exchange between Thoreau and Emerson, which Sophie and Casey will present, is one of only a few of Thoreau's correspondences in which it's possible to follow one correspondent answering another over a period of time. Some letters were probably lost as soon as they were received. Um, Thoreau probably lost some. Although he reused paper, and we find business letters used for many different things by him. Some must have simply disappeared over the years. You know, think about how many ways there are to lose track of a piece of paper. Other forces, though, more interesting and more intentional than time and accident, have also been at work. The inhabitants of 19th century Concord, unlike the Kardashians, were protective of their privacy. At that time, it was not uncommon after a death for correspondents to return the letters of the deceased to his or her family. And after Thoreau's death, Emerson actively collected letters because he had the intention of, and actually did, uh, publishing a, actually did publish a uh, selected volume, a selection of Thoreau's letters, letters to various persons. The, after Emerson was finished, he returned them to Thoreau's sister and mother. Not returned them, but gave them. They were the last surviving members of the immediate family. And they made the first set of decisions about what would be preserved. Now, there are 38 letters from Thoreau to members of his family that survive, including 13 to his cousin George Thatcher, but there's not a single letter from those family members to him. After Sophia's death, the letters and the other manuscripts went to, by, she passed them on, to Thoreau's Worcester disciple, Harrison Gray Otis Blake, who had the opportunity to make another set of decisions. Thoreau wrote 50 letters, long, philosophical, most of them, interesting letters to Blake, but only a part of one letter from Blake to Thoreau survives. It's hard to avoid the conclusion that both the Thoreau women and Blake did some active winnowing and other, uh, there may have been winnowing by the writers of letters too who did not return every letter to Emerson that they had gotten from Thoreau. We have evidence in surviving letters as well as in sources such as Thoreau's journal, where he, can, he mentions letters, and in dealer's catalogs of almost 150 letters Thoreau sent or received that are no longer extant. Who knows how many we don't know about? The point I want to make here is while, that while a single letter may be more or less revealing and can function as a window into the mind and the world of the author, Letters as a group, even in a volume titled Correspondence, which you might think means that the letters correspond to one another, rarely give you a coherent narrative. You have to be prepared to fill in a lot of blanks. So before Casey and Sophie begin, I want to give you some background about where, what they're going to be reading, because, I mean, it's 19th century. It's another time, another place, and all. These letters were written in fall 1847 and winter 1848, the ones they'll be reading. Thoreau was 30. Emerson was 44. Both men were living in Concord. This particular exchange was occasioned by the fact that Emerson was away lecturing in England and Scotland. And Thoreau was living in the Emerson household. In August, two months before his departure, Emerson had written his brother William about the domestic arrangements during his absence. His wife, Lydian, whose given name was Lydia, but Emerson, Emerson put the N in there because um, New Englanders tend to put in an R between two vowels that come together, and she would have been called Lydia, which neither of them thought was um, very euphonious. So Lydia Emerson, um, she decided to let go of Mrs. E.C. Goodwin, who'd managed the household since April 1846, and invited Henry Thoreau to spend the winter. Thoreau was to help her manage things in Emerson's absence, and he was also a favorite with the children. There were three children then. Ellen was nine. Edith turned seven in November, just after the first letter in this series, and Edward was three. The Emerson's first child, Waldo, had died in 1842 at the age of six. In one of these letters, testifying to the fact that Waldo's memory is kept alive, Thoreau passes on a comment by Eddie, by the little guy, about the brother he never knew. This was Thoreau's second stint with the Emersons. In 1841, when Thoreau and John, his brother, had had to close their school, they did open a school together in Concord. That's what they eventually did. Um, John became ill with tuberculosis. The school closed. Emerson had invited Thoreau to live in the attic room at the Thoreau house to do chores for his keep and, and to write. Emerson was 
a powerful mentor, an important mentor for a lot of young writers, um, Thoreau included. The relationship was complicated, but I don't have time to talk about that. <laughs> you need to know that Thoreau's mother took in boarders to help make ends meet, to help explain why Thoreau would decamp to the Emersons, or one reason why. The Thoreau household was always very active and probably very noisy. Um, the circumstance sheds a, a, a not, the, not that the Emerson household was completely calm, but calmer probably. The circumstance sheds a new light on Thoreau's move to Walden Pond. There are lots of fancy explanations, but maybe all he wanted was a little peace and quiet. <laughs> Thoreau lived with the Emerson family that time until 1843. In the first letter in this sequence, he notes that the two older Emerson children, Ellen and Edith, who had been four and two when, when he left in 1843, have not forgotten their old acquaintance. Thoreau left, I mean Emerson left for, Thoreau never left for Europe. Emerson left for Europe on October 5th, 1847. When Thoreau writes the first of these letters on November 14th, it's clear that he's established in Emerson's house. Emerson left England July 15th, 1848, and arrived in Boston on July 27th. Presumably Thoreau moved to the, back to the family home then. You'll notice that Thoreau's letters are long and expansive, full of family and town gossip. I omitted some of this for the reading because it's so particular you can't make sense of it unless you have the annotations in front of you. Emerson's letters are briefer, partly because he's a paid lecturer in England and his, much of his time is spoken for, and partly because as was the custom of the time. He expects that his letters to his wife, to Elizabeth Hoare, who um, was close to the family, and probably even to his children, would be read all around, would all be passed around. So he's writing, when Emerson writes to anybody in the, in the family, he's writing to everybody. Several things come up in Emerson's letters that I want to explain in advance. Writing on December 2nd, Emerson describes the establishment of a uniform time throughout Great Britain that had occurred the day before. This was a big deal. It was the culmination of years of effort. I mean, this is why Emerson mentions it. It may not seem so important, but he mentions it because for years there had been uh, an ongoing effort to standardize local mean times. Different towns around England had different times, and the time could vary based on solar time first, and then uh, local mean time was established. But times could vary from up to 20 minutes uh, between a town outside London and London. The times needed to be synchronized to allow for safer rail railroad operation. As the railroads went further, uh, as the Industrial Revolution picked up, Everybody needed to be on the same time. So that's the, that's the uh, uh, import of that comment in Emerson's letter. In his letter of January 28th, he praises a speech by the free trade advocate Richard Cobden, who'd helped establish the Anti-Corn Law League. I wish, the Anti-Corn Law League has always made me close my eyes and snore. But <laughs> it's important here. Corn means any grain that requires grinding, especially wheat. And the Anti-Corn Law League opposed legislation, which had been in effect since 1815, protectionist tariffs, which protected British growers of grains that were ground against imports. This resulted in higher prices for food, which was a great burden on the British poor. So it was an important um, social uh, and cultural issue in England, followed by those in America also. In the last letter in the sequence, Emerson mentioned several people, all of whom are real except Mr. Bull. Um, there he's referring to John Bull, the personification of England, just as Uncle Sam is the personification of the US. Both Emerson and Thoreau mention the Dial, a transcendentalist quarterly that was edited first by Margaret Fuller and then by Emerson with Thoreau's assistance. It ran from July 1840 through April 1844, a very small circulation, but the people in England whom Emerson is speaking to know about it. In his February 23rd letter, Thoreau notes that he lectured at the Lyceum on the rights and duties of the individual in relation to government. This is an early version of what he published in 1849 as Resistance to Civil Government and what appeared after his death as Civil Disobedience, the title under which most people know this essay. Now, in the persons of Casey Caldwell and Sophie Hassett, I give you Henry Thoreau and Waldo Emerson. <laughs> Thank you.
Concord, November 14th, 1847. Dear friend, I am but a poor neighbor to you here. A very poor companion am I. I understand that very well. But that need not prevent my writing to you now. I have almost never written letters in my life, yet I think I can write as good ones as I frequently see. So I shall not hesitate to write this, such as it may be, knowing that you will welcome anything that reminds you of Concord. I have banked up the young trees against the winter and the mice, and I will look out in my careless way to see when a pail is loose or a nail drops out of its place. The broad gaps, at least, I will occupy. I hardly wish that I could be of good service to this household, but I, who have used only these ten digits so long to solve the problem of living, how can I? This world is a cow that is hard to milk. Life does not come so easy, and ah, how thinly it is watered ere we get it. But the young bunting calf, he will get at it. There is no way so direct. This is to earn one's living by the sweat of one's brow. It is, little, it is a little like joining a community, this life, to such a hermit as I am. And I don't keep the accounts, and as I don't keep the accounts, I don't know whether this experiment will succeed or fail, finally. At any rate, it is good for society, and I do not regret my transient or my permanent share in it. Lydian and I make very good housekeepers. She is a very dear sister to me. Ellen and Edith and Eddie and Auntie Brown keep up the tragedy and comedy and tragic comedy of life as usual. <laughs> the two former have not forgotten their old acquaintance. Even Edith carries a young memory in her head, I find. Eddie can teach us all how to pronounce. If you should discover any new or rare breed of wooden or pewter horses, I have no doubt he will know how to appreciate it. He occasionally surveys mankind from my shoulders as widely and wisely as ever Johnson did. I respect him not a little, though it is I that lift him up there so unceremoniously, and sometimes I have to set him down again in a hurry according to his mere will and good pleasure. He very seriously asked me the other day, Mr. Thoreau, will you be my father? I am occasionally Mr. Rough and Tumble with him, that I may not miss him, and lest he should miss you very much. So you must come back soon, or you will be superseded. <laughs> Mr. Hosmer has been working at a tannery in Stowe for a fortnight, though he has just now come home sick. It seems that he was a tanner in his youth, and so he has made up his mind a little at last. This comes of reading the New Testament. Wasn't one of the apostles a tanner? Mrs. Hosmer remains here, and John looks stout enough to fill his own shoes and his father's, too. Cambridge College is really beginning to wake up and redeem its character and overtake the age. I see by the new catalog that they are about establishing a scientific school in connection with the university, at which anyone above 18 on paying $100 annually, Mr. Lawrence's 50000 will probably diminish this sum, may be instructed in the highest branches of science in astronomy, theoretical and practical, with the uses of the instruments, so the great Yankee astronomer may be born without delay, in mechanics and engineering to the last degree. Agassiz will ere long commence his lectures in the zoological department. A chemistry class has already been formed and is under the direction of Professor Horsford. A new and adequate building for these purposes is already being erected. They have been foolish enough to put at the end of all of this earnest the old joke of a diploma. Let every sheep keep but his own skin, I say. Uh, I have had a tragic correspondence, for the most part all on one side, with Miss Ford. She really did wish to, I hesitate to write, marry me. That is the way they spell it. Of course, I did not write a deliberate answer. How could I deliberate upon it? I sent back as distinct a no as I have learned to pronounce after considerable practice. And I trust that this no has succeeded. Indeed, I wish that it might burst like hollow shot after it had struck it and buried itself and make itself felt there. <laughs> there was no other way. I really had anticipated no such foe as this in my career. Now, I suppose you will like to hear of my book, though I have nothing worth writing about it. Indeed, for the last month or two, I have forgotten it, but shall certainly remember it again. 
Wiley and Putnam, Monroe, the Harpers, and Crosby and Nichols have all declined printing it with the least risk to themselves. But Wiley and Putnam will print it in their series and any of them anywhere at my risk. If I liked the book well enough, I should not delay, but for the present, I am indifferent. I believe this is, after all, the course you advised to let it lie. I do not know what to say of myself. I sit before my green desk in the chamber at the head of the stairs and attend to my thinking, sometimes more, sometimes less distinct. I am not unwilling to think great thoughts if there are any in the wind, but what they are, I am not sure. They suffice to keep me awake while the day lasts at any rate. Perhaps they will redeem some portion of the night ere long. I can imagine you astonishing, bewildering, confounding, and sometimes delighting John Bull with your Yankee notions, and that he begins to take a pride in the relationship at last, introduced to all the stars of England in succession after the lectures, until you pine to thrust your head once more into a genuine and unquestionable nebula, if there be any left. I trust a common man will be the most uncommon to you before you return to these parts. I have thought there was some advantage, even in death, by which we mingle with a herd of common men. They have been choosing between John Kyes and Sam Staples, if the world wants to know it, as representatives of this town, and Staples is chosen. The candidates for governor, think of my writing this to you, were Governor Briggs and General Cushing, and Briggs is elected, though the Democrats have gained. Ain't I a brave boy to know so much of politics for the nonce? But I shouldn't have known it if Coombs hadn't told me. They've had a peace meeting here. I shouldn't think of telling you of it if I didn't know that anything would do for the English market. And some men, Deacon Brown at the head, have signed a long pledge swearing that they will treat all mankind as brothers, henceforth. I think I shall wait and see how they treat me first. I think that nature meant kindly when she made our brothers few. However, my voice is still for peace. So goodbye, and a truce to all joking, my dear friend from Henry David Thoreau. Manchester, 2nd of December, 1847. Dear Henry, very welcome in the parcel was your letter, very precious your thoughts and tidings. It is one of the best things connected with my coming hither that you could and would keep the homestead. That fireplace shines all the brighter and has a certain permanent glitter, glimmer, therefore. Thanks, evermore thanks for the kindness which I well discern to the youths of the house, to my darling little horsemen of pewter, leather, wooden, rocking, and what other breeds destined, I hope, to ride Pegasus yet, and I hope not destined to be thrown. To Edith, who long ago drew hope, from you verses which I carefully preserve, and to Ellen, who by speech and now by letter, I find old enough to be companionable and to choose and reward her own friends from her own fashions. She sends me a poem today, which I have read three times. I believe I must keep back all of my communication on English topics until I get to London, which is England. Everything centralizes in this magnificent machine which England is. Manufacture for the world she is become, or becoming one complete tool or engine in herself. Yesterday, the time all over the kingdom was reduced to Greenwich time. At Liverpool, where I was, the clocks were put forward 12 minutes. This had become quite necessary on account of the railroads which bind the whole country into swiftish connection and require so much accurate interlocking, intersection, and simultaneous arrival that the difference of time produced confusion. Every man in England carries a little book in his pocket called the Bradshaw's Guide, which contains timetables of every arrival and departure at every station on all the railroads of the kingdom. It is published anew on the first day of each month and costs sixpence. The preceding effects of electric telegraph will give a new importance to such arrangements. But lest I should not say what is needful, I will postpone England once and for all and say that I am not of opinion that your book should be delayed a month. I should print it at once, 
nor do I think that you would incur any risk in doing so that you cannot well afford. It is very certain to have readers and debtors here as well as there. The dial is absurdly well known here. We at home, I think, are always a little ashamed of it. I am. And yet here it is spoken of with the utmost gravity. And I do not laugh. <laughs> Carlyle writes me that he is reading Doomsday Book. You tell me in your letter one odious circumstance, which we will dismiss from remembrance henceforth. Charles Lane entreated me in London to ask you to forward his dials to him, which must be done if you consent thus. Three bound volumes are among his books in my library. The fourth volume is in unbound numbers at J. Munro and Company's shop, received there in a parcel to my address a day or two before I sailed, and which I forgot to carry to Concord. It must be claimed without delay. It is certainly there, was opened by me and left. And they can enclose all four volumes to Chapman for me. Well, I am glad the press nonce at Walden suffered no more, but it is a great loss, as it is which years will not repair. I see that I have balked you by the promise of a letter which ends in as good as none. But I write with counted minutes and a miscellany of things before me. Yours affectionate, R.W.E. Concord, December 29th, 1847. My dear friend, I thank you for your letter. I was very glad to get it and I am glad again to write you. However slow the steamer, no time intervenes between the writing and the reading of thoughts, but they come fresh from the most distant port. I am here still, and very glad to be here, and shall not trouble you with my complaints because I do not fill my place better. I have had many good hours in the chamber at the head of the stairs, a solid time, it seems to me. Next week, I am going to give an account to the Lyceum of my expedition to Maine, Theodore Parker lectures tonight. We have had Whipple on genius, too mighty a subject for him, with his antithetical definitions, new vamped, what it is, what it is not, but altogether what it is not. Cuffing it this way and cuffing it that as if it were an India rubber ball. Really, it is a subject which should expand and accumulate itself before the speaker's eyes as he goes on, like the snowballs with which boys roll in the streets. And when he stops, it should be so large that he cannot start it, but must leave it there. Hudson, too, has been here with a dark shadow in the core of him, and his desperate wit so much indebted to the surface of him, wringing out his words and snapping them off like a dishcloth. Very remarkable, but not memorable. Ellen and I have a good understanding. I appreciate her genuineness. Edith tells me after her fashion, by and by I shall grow up to be a woman, and then I shall remember how you exercised me. Eddie has been to Boston to Christmas, but can remember nothing but the coaches, all Kendall's coaches. There is no variety of that vehicle that he is not familiar with. He did try once to tell us something else, but after thinking and stuttering a long time said, I don't know what the word is, the one word, forsooth, that would have disposed of all that Boston phenomenon. If you did not know him better than I, I could tell you more. He is a good companion for me, and I am glad that we are all natives of Concord. It is young Concord. Look out, world. <laughs> Mr. Outcut seems to have sat down for the winter. He has got Plato and other books to read. He is as large-featured and hospitable to traveling thoughts and thinkers as ever, but with the same creaking and sneaking Connecticut philosophy as ever, mingled with what is better. If he would only stand up straight and toe the line, though he were to put off several degrees of largeness and put on considerable degree of littleness. After all, I think we can call him particularly your man. I have had pleasant walks and talks with Channing, James Clark, uh, the Swedenborgian that was, is at the poorhouse, insane, with two large views, so that he cannot support himself. I see him working with Fred and the rest. Better than be there not insane. It is strange that they will make an ado when a man's body is buried, 
and not when he thus really and tragically dies, or seems to die. Good night, Henry Thoreau. I have forwarded Lane's dials to Monroe with the proper instructions, and he tells the express man that it is right. To Fenny Street, Higher Britain, Manchester, 28th of January, 1848. Dear Henry, one roll of letters has gone today to Concord and to New York, and perhaps I still have time to get this into the leathern bag before it is carted to the wharf. I have to thank you for your letter, which was a true refreshment. Let who or what pass, there stands the dear Henry, if indeed any body has a right to call him so. Erect, serene, and undeceivable, so ever let it be. I should quite subside into idolatry of some of my friends. If I were not every now and then appraised that the world is wiser than any one of its boys, and penetrates us with its sense to the disparagement of the subtleties of private gentlemen. Last night, as I believe I've already told Lydian, I heard the best man in England make perhaps his best speech. Cobden, who is the Corcordius, the object of honor and belief to risen and rising England, a man of great discretion who never overstates nor states prematurely, nor has a particle of unnecessary genius or hope to mislead him, no waste strength but calm, sure of his fact, simple and nervous in stating it, as a boy in laying down the rules of a game of football which have been violated, above all educated by his dogma of free trade, led on by it to new lights and correlative liberalities at our, as our abolitionists have been by their principle to so many reforms, then this man has made no mistake. He is dedicated himself to his work of convincing this kingdom of the impolicy of corn laws, lectured in every town where they would hear him, and at last carried his point against immense odds, and yet has never accepted any compromise or stipulation from the government. He might have been in the ministry. He will never go there, except with absolute empire for his principle, which cannot yet be conceded. He had neglected and abandoned his prosperous calico printing to his partners, and the triumphant league have subscribed between 60 and 80,000 pounds as the Cobden Fund, whereby he is made independent. It was quite beautiful, even sublime last night, to notice the moral radiations which this free trade dogma seemed to throw out, all unlooked for, to the great audience, who instantly and delightedly adopted them. Such contrasts of sentiment to the vulgar hatred and fear of France and jealousy of America that pervades the newspapers. Cobden himself looked thoughtful and surprised, as if he saw a new future. Old colonial Paronet Thompson, the father of free trade, whose catechism on the corn laws set all those brights and Cobdens first on cracking this nut, was present and spoke in a very vigorous, rasp-like tone. Gibson, a member of the British government, a great Suffolk squire, and a convert to these opinions, made a very satisfactory speech, and our old abolition friend, George Thompson, brought up the rear. Though he whom I now heard for the first time is merely a piece of rhetoric and not a man of facts and figures and English solidity like the rest. The audience play no inactive part, but the most acute and sympathizing, and the agreeable result was the demonstration of the air medical as well as the moral optimism of peace and generosity. Forgive, forgive this most impertinent scribble. Your friend, R.W.E., I surely did not mean to put you off for the report when I begun, but... <laughs> Concord, February 23rd, 1848. Dear Waldo, for I think I have heard that is your name. My letter, which was put last in the leathern bag, arrived first. Whatever I may call you, I know you better than I know your name. Lydian is too unwell to write you, and so I must tell you what I can about the children and herself. I am afraid she has not told you how unwell she is, or today perhaps we may say has been. She has been confined to her chamber four or five weeks, and three or four weeks at least to her bed, 
with the jaundice, accompanied with constant nausea, which makes life intolerable to her. This added to her general Ill, Ill health has made her very sick. She is as yellow as saffron. The doctor, who comes once a day, does not let her read, nor can she now, nor hear much reading. She has written her letters to you till recently sitting up in bed, but he said that he would not come again if she did so. She has Abby and Elmira to take care of her, and Mrs. Brown to read to her, and I also occasionally have something to read or to say. The doctor says she must not expect to take any comfort of her life for a week or two yet. She wishes me to say that she has written two long and full letters to you about the household economies, etc., which she hopes have not been delayed. The children are quite well and full of spirits and are going through a regular course of picture seeing with commentary by me every evening for Eddie's behoof. All the annuals and diadems are in requisition, and Eddie is forward to exclaim when the hour arrives, Now for the dem-dems! I overheard this dialogue with Frank when Frank came down to breakfast the other morning. Eddie. Why, Frank, I am astonished that you should leave your boots in the dining room. Frank. I guess you mean surprised, don't you? Eddie. No! Boots! <laughs> if Waldo were here, he said the other night at bedtime, we'd be four going upstairs. Would he like to tell Papa anything? No, not anything. But finally, yes, he would. The one of the white horses in his new barouche is broken. <laughs> Ellen and Edith will perhaps speak for themselves as I hear something about letters to be written by them. I see Channing often. He also goes often to Alcott's and confesses that he has made a discovery in him and gives vent to his admiration or his confusion in characteristic exaggerations. But between this extreme and that, you may get a fair report and draw an inference if you can. Sometimes he will ride a broomstick still, though there is nothing to keep him or it up, but a certain centrifugal force of whim which is soon spent, and there lies your stick, not worth picking up to sweep an oven with now. His accustomed path is strewn with them. But then again, and perhaps for the most part, he sits on the cliffs amid the lichens and flits past on noise, noiseless pinion like the barred owl in the daytime, as wise and unobserved. Lectures begin to multiply in my desk. I have one on friendship, which is new, and the materials of some others. I read one last week to the Lyceum on the rights and duties of the individual in relation to the government, much to Mr. Alcott's satisfaction. Joe Britton has failed and gone into chancery, but the woods continue to fall before the axes of other men. Neighbor Coombs was lately found dead in the woods near Goose Pond with his half-empty jug after he'd been missing a week. Mr. Hosmer, who is himself again and living in Concord, has just hauled away the rest of your wood, amounting to ten and a half cords. The newspapers say that they have printed a pirated edition of your essays in England. Is it as bad as they say? An undisguised, unmitigated piracy? If you have any directions to give about the trees, you must not forget that spring will soon be upon us. Farewell. From your friend, Henry Thoreau. London, 25th of March, 1848. Dear Henry, your letter was very welcome and its introduction heartily accepted. In this city and nation of pomps, where pomps too are solid, I fall back on my friends with wonderful refreshment. It is a pity, however, that you should not see this England with its indescribable material superiorities of every kind, the just confidence which immense successes of all sorts have generated in the Englishman that he can do everything, and which his manners, though he is bashful and reserved, betray the abridgment of all expression, which dense population and the roar of nation enforces, the solidity of science and merit, which in any place you are sure to find. The church and some effects of primogeniture accepted, but I cannot tell my story now. I admire the English, I think, never more than when I meet Americans, as, for example, at Mr. Bancroft's American soiree, which he holds every Sunday night. 
Great is the self-respect of Mr. Bull. He is very short-sighted, and without his eyeglass, cannot see as far as your eyes to know how you like him, so he quite neglects that point. The Americans see very well, too well, and the traveling portion are very light troops. But I must not vent my ill humor on my poor compatriots. They are welcome to their revenge, and I am quite sure of no reason to spare me if they too are at this hour writing letters to their gossips. I have not gone to Oxford yet, though I still correspond with my friend there, Mr. Clough. I meet many young men here who come to me simply as one of their school of thought, but not often in this class any giants. Uh, Mr. Morell has written a history of philosophy, and Wilkinson, who is a socialist now and gone to France, I have seen with respect. I went last Sunday for the first time to see Lane at Ham and dined with him. He was full of friendliness and hospitality and has a school of 16 children, one lady as a matron, then old him. That is all the household. They look just comfortable. Mr. Galpin, tell the Shakers, has married. I spent most of that day in visiting Hampton Court and Richmond and went also into Pope's Grotto at Twickenham and saw Horace Walpole's Villa of Strawberry Hill. Ever your friend, Waldo E. Thank you so much. That was terrific. It was bringing back Emerson and Thoreau and their relationship in a way that I think you can't do if you're reading yourself. It's, it's, you, can, you can experience it in, in a new way when you hear someone else. No, Sophie's going to leave. I was wondering, no, it's OK. I won't, is there, I, I, I'm going to open it up for questions to see. And I thought people might want to ask you guys questions as well. Are there any questions that uh, the presentation has inspired <laughs> for anybody? <laughs> okay, Sophie, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I shouldn't have called you out, but I really did think that, you know, people might have had questions about your experience. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, they were, I mean, there were wonderful <laughs> presentations, and I'm just, uh, I'm just curious because you mentioned the relationship between Thoreau and Emerson could get complicated. <laughs> um, and to what extent, even during the time when these letters were written, was their relationship uh, strained? Um, to what extent do you find in the letters there's more rhetoric of friendship than actual friendship? And should the letters that were read today, should they have been read with genuine sense of friendship or more strained rhetorical? That's an interesting question. <laughs> the, the fact is that at this point, Emerson and Thoreau were probably closer, um, it, more in tune with one another than they, than they were again. Um, this Thoreau, the, the letter in which Thoreau addresses Emerson as Waldo is the only letter in which he uses Emerson's first name. I, I, we know him as Ralph Waldo Emerson, but Waldo was the name that was used um, familiarly. Mm -hmm. So I, this, the relationship was sincere and close and confiding at this point. What happened was that Thoreau went to Emerson for help, or counted on Emerson for help, in publishing A Week on the Concord in Merrimack. And the book was ultimately published, but it didn't do very well. This is 47, 48. Thoreau published it in 49. Um, Thoreau writes in his journal, I, I asked my friend for criticism. He doesn't identify his friend, but I asked my friend for criticism and he gave me none. But after the book was published, I got plenty. <laughs> not, 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 not quite in those words. But he seems to have felt, and 
it's not possible to know for sure, but he seems to have felt that Emerson held back in really um, helping him with the structure, the content, the, the, the ideas. And um, that, he found that ungenerous. And there is a component also of, of I think, resistance to um, the mentorship eventually. Thoreau felt some burden of being mentored by Emerson. And so in addition to feeling betrayed by, by Emerson's treatment of his work, um, he felt um, that he was not being subservient to, but, but he felt perhaps condescended to. I mean, Emerson did count on Thoreau, and this was, in, this was read, this came out in some of the letters. Emerson counted on Thoreau to do some of the things that um, an assistant does. Now, if you know much about Thoreau, you can imagine that graded on him a bit, <laughs> even, though, even though he accepted the responsibility. So I, they appreciated one another. Um, they continued to have they continue to have a relationship, a personal relationship in Concord that isn't recorded in letters because, you know, if you live in the same town, you don't have to write letters to one another. One of the reasons there are so few letters um, in the correspondence, comparatively, is that most of the people Thoreau cared about lived where he was, and so he, he didn't have to write letters. Um, Emerson said something about how Thoreau, in, the, in, Thoreau, in his eulogy for Thoreau, he said something about how Thoreau only found himself in opposition. And Thoreau was a hard, was a hard person to have a conversation, a, a, a desultory conversation with. And I think that probably, Emerson had gone out into the world, Emerson was a more worldly, polished, sophisticated person, and I think as they became, as Thoreau became who he was going to be, he and Emerson were probably less aligned. Mm -hmm. So, Jane, let me get Jane. Sure. You want to, if the, we need to, whoops, uh, I no, knew I, I would do this. I don't, I don't need it. Well, what do you guys think who are recording? Should we, should we have? Yeah, we need it for the recording. Yeah, that's the, that's the thing. That it's, it doesn't, it, it does not, um, increase the sound. It's just a matter of recording. I just have a very... Okay. Um, yeah, I here. wondered if Emerson's children grew up to be correspondents of Thoreau, and if so, do any of those letters exist? None, none exist. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows whether there were any? There, there may have been. There may have been. And Emerson's son, Eddie, Edward Waldo Emerson, wrote a biography, a short, short memoir called um, Henry Thoreau as Remembered by a Young Friend. But again, you know, they were, they were there uh, in the same town for, uh, until Thoreau died. Uh, the kids, the Emerson children, um, Edward went to Harvard. The, the uh, sisters stayed in Concord, so there would not have been the opportunity for much correspondence. Chris. You mentioned Thoreau res resenting the mentorship. Could it have gone the other way, too? Well, it might have. What Emerson might have resented was Thoreau's resentment. <laughs> I mean, I, I, it might have. My sense of Emerson's personality is that it was a kind of um, less focused and Emerson had a much wider acquaintance than, than Thoreau did. And um, I think probably a higher level of tolerance for a lot of different kinds of behaviors. And so I think it's more likely that, that it was within Thoreau. Um, but it could certainly have been a mutual uh, disadmiration society at certain points. Now there's a suggestion, there, there was a, 
The first uh, modern biographer of Thoreau wrote that uh, Thoreau was in the common man's parlance in love with Emerson's wife, Lydian. So there was a suggestion uh, in the early biography that, or in early kind of uh, biographical ideas about Thoreau, that, that, that that might have had something to do with friction between Thoreau and Emerson. In fact, one of the things the letters, I, I realized as I was reading the letters, and as I realized that, I said this, that when whoever wrote to Concord, whoever was away and wrote to Concord, the letters got passed around. When Emerson was in England, his letters were passed around to members of the family. When Thoreau was on Staten Island, his letters were passed around in the Emerson household. Emerson wrote a very, I mean, Thoreau wrote a, a very intense, um, admiring, almost mystically admiring letter about to, about his relationship and his feelings um, to Lydian. And you know, this is, I, 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 I have read this letter and thought, God, I, it, it, what would Emerson have thought reading this? And then I realized he did read it. And Thoreau knew he was going to read it. And so the element of, of a kind of clandestine relationship between the two was not there. Everything that Thoreau expressed about and to Lydian, Emerson knew about. So, you know, I think Thoreau was genuinely inspired by Lydian, and I think he probably was not as the common man. <laughs> he was not what the common man would have called in love with her. But, you know, opinions can differ. The historical record is incomplete. <laughs> There's one more thing I wondered. Was uh, Thoreau left-handed? I don't think so, but how would I know that? I don't know. The lines don't incline. They tend to slope. There's a, yeah, well, I don't know. And there looked like there were some voids, as if yeah. it was creeping across the page. Could be. Well, yeah, I don't know. Often yeah, so yeah. What's well? Direction. There's some. There's a lot of penciled stuff. I'll have to check which direction the which direction the streaks go. <laughs> Kelly, I have two questions. Uh, one is, if someone's to me, it seemed like being gone for a year or so, how would there be enough time for the letters to pass back and forth? I had no idea there was that kind of quickness through the shipping of the letters. Yeah, I think that I, I've, I've, I've looked this up. I think that the, the ship that broke the record made it in 12 days, wow. which I thought was pretty fast too, yeah. yeah. So at, at that time, that was the And the other question record. I had is, uh, I felt a little bit of uh, that time period's attitude towards women. You were talking about embracing the you know, the endearment of, of he had towards that, uh, towards uh, Thoreau's, towards Emerson's wife. Towards but Lydia. when Emerson was talking about looking for the great minds, you know, in England, I just kind of felt that, that women weren't the players. But I had a, a sense that the transcendentalists, did they have, they, they seemed like they were more, you know, free thinking and that there were women that were part of that community. There were. Margaret Fuller, um, uh, Carolyn Sturgis, there were women who were part, and, and, and Lydia Emerson, there were women who were, who were part of the community, but it was certainly still um, uh, not, an, not an equal, not a matter of, of, of equals. I don't think that there were women in the, the hedge club, in the kind of founding club of the transcendentalists. So. Um, I, they had a, a long way to go still. <laughs> and, Emer and, and Thoreau's comments about the bullet lodging, I mean, the pretty, pretty brutal comments about poor Sophia Ford, who has, has had the effrontery to propose to him. He wants to shoot her and have the bullet explode inside. I mean, we could do it with a little less of that. <laughs> So has people, have people used these papers at all for exploring feminism? Well, there are plenty of um, 
additions of women that have, that have been set up, I mean this is a very particular answer, that have been set up in response to the fact that the first editions that were established by the Modern Language Association and the National Endowment for the Humanities were editions of men. I mean the first 13 uh, kind of canonical American authors were all men. And, and as, the, as uh, the, the canon expanded, people were very interested in bringing in women, giving their papers the same kind of attention that men's, that the papers of great men got. Have people used the Thoreau material to explore feminism? I don't know. I don't, I, I can't think of, um, I, I can't think of, of any examples. But I don't know, you know, I don't know what they're all doing out there. <laughs> so, well, I have, I have, I was, I was, um, I have learned, I learned at the beginning of this, of this presentation or before it started that there's going to be another presentation about Thoreau's letters on Saturday, May 31st. Um, Joseph Miller, Joe Miller, who's here, um, is going to speak about primarily, I guess, the letters between Thoreau and Harrison Gray Otis Blake. Um, this is going to be at Concord Hall um, under the auspices of the Institute of World Culture. This is on Chapala Street. Do you have a couple of flyers at, on the table? Okay, anyone who's interested is welcome to um, attend. I guess, right? Okay. Well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. I, I spent a lot of time to talk about that.